yeah. start? Sure. Call the meeting to order. Oops, I better turn on my mic here. Calling the meeting in order for the work session. Um, we'll first start with uh, Jefferson Ben Rifle uh, hiring timeline, please. And I should note, uh, Board Member Parker is out of town and Board Member uh, Tolkey had a meeting he could not get out of, but he will be here for the Southeast Tech Board meeting. All right, good. Oh. I was gonna say good morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, today we're just um, share the timeline for hiring for Jefferson and Ben Rifle. So it's an exciting time when you start to think about um, staffing those buildings and a year from now, we will be opening those doors. And so it's an exciting time. So today we'll talk about Jefferson and high school and they, the hiring timelines for certain positions look the same, but there are some differences. So the first one, the Cavaliers, um, starting to think about those buildings and looking at what that looks like on the northwest side of town. So far we've hired Don, um, Dan Conrad for the principal, Chad Statham for the activities director, and Jennifer McKellop for the lead clerical, and they're all housed currently out at New Tech High. And it's a great place for them. They're right next to the building. They're at New Tech because that's part of Jefferson and they're able to see um, those students and get to know them and they'll get to know them as faces. Moving into the fall and early winter, we'll hire that counseling department chair in November, followed by the rest of the department chairs in December so that way they can start building their teams and they can be part of that interview process as that moves along. And then thinking about activities, um, directors, head coaches, we know that they need to build their programs and start recruiting and auditions and things as you move into the spring. So that's naturally that next step. And those will be November hires with uh, winter and spring coaches into that February timeline. And these are, you know, they might flow into the next months, but these are general guidelines. And then assistant principals will bring those on board in January to help support um, Mr. Conrad and his team with that hiring process. We have that one lead clerical already hired, but we'll get that registrar on in January as we start to register for courses um, in early January. And then the activities clerical will come on to help support those directors and um, coaches as we bring those programs online and the rest of them. And then the custodial staff, the three main custodians, the manager, the engineer, and the groundskeeper will be hired in February. That's exciting to think about that groundskeeper and we'll have some nice grass growing out there as soon as spring comes along. And then the rest of the custodial staff in April. Teaching staff, big chunk of um, teachers that we are going to have to hire. And it's not just a Jefferson hire. We have to think about it's across the district because we've changed boundaries. And so we'll post those positions, but as those applicants come in, it'll be a collaborative effort with all those high schools to look at those group of applicants to make sure we have adequate staffing across all our high school buildings because we know we need to have equitable, equitable programs at all of them. So they'll work together to make sure that if that happens in that um, Mr. Conrad just doesn't take a clean sweep out of one building, but knowing that we're gonna have to adjust our staffing across that building, across the district. And then the remaining teachers will hire in May and those could be outside applicants. But there again, after retirements come in and the movements are made, um, we'll, they'll work with Becky Dorman on that just to make sure we can fill that at Jefferson, but across the district also. And then special services, our nurse, our IEP facilitator and support staff, they'll come on in June and our educational assistants also in the summer. And those are, that follows pretty much the timeline we do with other staff in those. So that's the Jefferson hiring timeline. Ben Rifle looks similar, but with some differences. Uh, Mr. Hieronymus is hired as that principal and he'll be ready to take on the challenges and the opportunities at Ben Rifle. And then early December, we'll start to look for his replacement at Edison and, and get that position hired. So that coordinates in with the assistant principal shifting at the high school and all of those. Um, so we'll look for his replacement and then we'll hire that athletic director about that same time. Assistant principal right away in January, so that person's on board to help 
Mr. Hieronymus with the hiring for Ben Rifle, and then we'll hire that lead clerical that will be there to support them also. And then the rest of the clerical will have that counselor clerical in February, the other two in June. And then we have our custodial managers and engineer in February and our night custodians in April. Teaching staff will follow very much the same as, as the Jefferson. We'll hire 90% of those staff. Again, it'll be a collaborative effort because we know we have some shifting across the district. Um, Memorial will become a little bit smaller. We're, how does that affect? We're on separate sides of town, but it's still gonna affect all of that in Patrick and Edison. So 90% of those staff, middle school principals will work together and then we'll hire the remaining staff in May. We'll hire those counselors in February so they can help with those transition meetings as they go out into the elementaries to encourage kids and get them excited. Um, the Ben Rifle counselors will need to go into the feeder schools for that school also. And then special services, IEP and support staff in June with educational assistance in the summer. And that takes us right up to next year. And next year we can have pictures. <laughs> this is a late summer picture of Ben Rifle on the top and Jefferson on the bottom, but very excited to see what they look like next year at this time. So that's the timeline for hiring for Ben Rifle and Jefferson. I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Boyson. Um, it's exciting that we have these buildings coming on. You know, we've been dealing with a lot of other issues and um, this is just a real exciting time for the Sioux Falls School District. I hand it to you and to Becky Dorman. Good luck in all your hiring adventures with everything else going on. So appreciate it. And our district is a great employer uh, for the city of Sioux Falls. So if you're interested, we are looking for many, many more people. And it, it, you can see it's not just teachers and administrators that we need within these buildings to make them function takes that whole group. Yeah. Yes. I was just gonna add that um, I know sometimes people think in their minds, like if I'm going to a new school, my kid's gonna have all new teachers. And I just wanna encourage people to think like you mentioned, bigger picture and that, you know, as we pull students out of one building, we also have to pull staff out of those same buildings. And so a, a teacher or a coach that your student might have at Roosevelt or Washington or Lincoln may actually move to Jefferson because there's an opportunity that they didn't have at one of their existing buildings. Maybe their department chair has been their department chair for a long time and plans on maintaining that position and they're interested in that role in a new building. And so just as any student, so if my kids go to Washington, my student could have a brand new teacher next year or they could have a, a seasoned teacher and that, that will be the exact same truth at Jefferson or at Ben Rifle as well because it's a new building doesn't mean that all staff are new to the district or new to the teaching profession. So I know sometimes that, that gets lost, but I just wanna make sure that people realize that we will have great staff, some with a lot of experience and some that are brand new at all of our buildings next year. So just as the same as every year. I think that's a good point. And when we think about it, we're not bringing in 1800 new students and we're not bringing in right. 150 new staff. We have the students, we have the staff but how does that work mm -hmm. um, within the district? Because we are a district employee. So it's a great opportunity, very exciting. Yeah, thank you. I, and I kind of want to rib my friend Todd Veek right now. I wish Todd Tolke was here, but with the Jefferson building is something we were discussed ad nauseum was the outdoor classroom. And as we go forward with planning, it probably will get a lot of use maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. And those learning stairs. I yeah, and the lear Great. learning stairs that we'll see. But I think the outdoor classroom might actually yes. have space. will get so, used more. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just as an aside, while Casey's getting set up, is um, we'll have an update on both of those facilities here in another couple of weeks where we'll go a little more in depth on the progress of the buildings themselves. And I was just reminded I need to go drive by and see what things look like as it's coming along. Good afternoon. Hello. I uh, just wanted to come in and present our uh, proposal for return to play in our activities here in the Sioux Falls School District. Um, just kind of give you a little bit of insight into what the planning process was for us. So as activities principals, as we got together in May, late April, 
uh, we really went back to this old IQ test. And Denzel Washington talks about it in one of his graduation speeches where there's nine dots. You have to draw five lines without lifting the pencil off the paper. And in order to do that, you got to think outside the box. So we really challenged our activities principals and our coaches as we went into our plan that this is uncertain times and it's going to look different than anything that we've ever had. So we're going to have to think outside the box. It's not going to be the normal that we have in our activities plan. So as we did that, we set our goal and our number one goal. Uh, activities are really important to us as activities principals, directors, coaches, things of that nature. We know they're important to our kids, but the number one priority that we have in our activities department is to develop guidelines and an opportunity for our athletes and our uh, students participating in fine arts to provide a safe opportunity for them to come back and participate in the, the activities that they love. But in order to do that, we have to have guidelines and policies and procedures to follow so that we maintain our number one goal, and that's to be in traditional learning. We don't want to be in, in remote learning. So whatever we can do to assist that, and that's kind of why the why behind the, the guidelines and protocols that we have in place right now. Um, I will point your attention there. There was a study that the South Dakota High School Activities Association released to us, uh, our, our member schools, and it just tells us the importance of, you know, uh, being involved in kids active and being in the sports that they love and what the impact was with the school closure, closures and, and sports cancellations this last spring. So when we looked at that, we all know the importance of that. And so we got together with uh, a lot of our medical providers, uh, the South Dakota Department of Health, Molly Satter and her staff were very Im important in this planning process. And we all put our minds together to try and and develop these guidelines and procedures that we uh, are putting forward to our coaches and our directors. So, just to kind of give you a fifty thousand foot view on the 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 pol or the the procedures that we'll have in place, we'll have the COVID guidelines, and those will be in view in every activity that we have. Our kids will have these posted in their locker rooms. They'll have them posted at their practices, at their rehearsals, everything of that nature. They probably roll their eyes every time they see us now because they've heard those things so many times, but the importance of keeping that education to all of our students involved is really good and, and the proper hygiene and social distancing and stuff of that nature and we'll have them posted at all of our events. The key principles uh, that have been directed by the Department of Health, um, all, all stuff that we've seen to this point, but all of this has been released in a, in a packet to our coaches and our directors to ensure that they're promoting those to our students and we're talking about those and having those important conversations with all of our students involved in our activities. The health and safety measures that we are going in place and thank you to you guys for all your guidance that you've had on the return to learn. We've, we've taken a lot of those measures as well and implemented them into our return to play. So you'll see a lot of the similarities between the two plans that we have there. We have moved to the expected and all of our medical providers have really emphasized that when we're on bus trips and we're traveling together and in those close quarters within that six feet, the masks are gonna help. And the study by the National Federation on uh, um, the trombone player with the mask and all that type of stuff and the benefits that it does have, it's, it's not political, it's just those are the proven facts and they're not gonna deem kids as close contacts if we have those in those, in those close spaces. So, those are the health and safety measures that we kind of landed on in our return to play. Um, some of those are directed from our national office where they're making mandatory um, modifications in our sports and our fine arts, and some of them are optional. Um, and we are probably gonna adopt both of those. Obviously, we gotta go with the mandatory ones, but the optional ones are making sense to us too. And we were, we're giving guidance to our coaches and our directors as we go through all those. But it's weird to say because it goes against everything that we promote in activities. We promote community, we promote sportsmanship, we promote supporting each other and family, and all of those things are going away. Now, no fist bumps, no high fives, no starting lineup tunnels, all that type of stuff. So it's, it's going to, like we said, look a lot different than it ever has been. 
the screening questions, uh, those were updated and we asked those, those to our student athletes every time they're gonna to come to one of our events or when they're gonna come into our locker room, when they get on a bus for travel, all that type of stuff. Those are the questions that we have. And we have a, a documentation tool and Excel sheet where they put the roster on there and they document it. And this has been, thanks to Molly and her staff, she's given our activities principals a really good guidance up to this point on how to contact Trace and do all that type of stuff. And it's really benefited our programs. There's other schools that have been going where they just kind of turn it over to the Department of Health and they're shutting kids down in full programs down where the Sioux Falls School District, we haven't shut down one program yet. Um, we've been really on top of that and I really credit uh, Molly and her staff for helping us guide us through that and our activities principals have been, been working really hard here the last month, two months to make sure that our kids are, are staying involved and healthy and safe as we go through that. And then that's kind of what I'm talking about, the protocol to assist. Um, it, it's a lot of work. Um, I'll be honest, I'm really nervous about our coaches, our directors. Um, we have a lot of really talented coaches and directors, but it's gonna take a lot of work and I'm worried about burnout and then teaching and all that type of stuff. But the great thing is they all have really positive attitudes right now, really great attitudes because we're getting to do the things that we love to do. Um, but there's gonna be assigned seats on bus. There's gonna be cohorts is what we talked about. Try and keep the same five kids together. If they're in the locker room together, they're on the bus but in the same seats by each other. When we come to the locker room, it's not gonna be a typical locker room situation. There's gonna be an A, B, C, D group that goes in there. The A group is assigned lockers all six feet apart so that we have that documentation and stuff like that. So if you look at just those few things that we're looking at, that's a lot of work for our activity director or our our directors and our coaches and stuff like that, but they're ready to hit it hit it head on and, and see if we can do this and provide these opportunities for that. But we're looking at all those things that we have there in our return to play. And then events, um, like I said, it's, it's a community gathering usually, and we're very fortunate in the city of Sioux Falls that we have three public high schools and five middle schools that really get along with each other. And they're probably all friends and they come to our events and they're, in groups together and Lincoln's talking to Washington and Roosevelt's talking to Lincoln and all these type of things, but that's probably not gonna look very similar this, this next year just because we're gonna have to come and go and no tailgating and leaving events immediately after and all that type of stuff. So those are all things that we're gonna have to have in place at our events. So the big question that we really wanted to kind of present to you today, um, they're, they're kind of all over the board right now with fan attendance and this is one of the big questions and it goes right back to the goal that we have. Our goal is to keep traditional learning as long as we possibly can and hopefully for the entire year. So one of the big issues and one of the hot topics in our activities department is do you have fan attendance? Do you not have fan attendance? And as you can see, it's all over the board. There's Houston Speedway. Last week, packed 9,000 people, no mask, and then you got Major League Baseball, NBA, uh, with no fans, and they got fake cardboard fans in there. So, I mean, we're kind of all over the board on everything that we're doing. Um, but just to kind of give you a little background before I give you our plan, so the National Federation at the start of the summer came out with guidance, and it was a tiered plan, and their recommendations are there in front of you. Um, it looks a little bit different than the plan that we had because it has essential and it really didn't make sense to us, but we love the tiered plan and stuff like that. And, and as well as the South Dakota High School, when they came out with their guidance, this uh, probably about two to three weeks ago now, um, they also had the tiered plan in their guidance for, for us as well. So. When we looked at that, and then at the start of this, when this whole thing happened, the CDC, as we were getting ready to host state basketball and we were getting ready to host the Dakota Relays in the Sioux Falls School District, we saw guidance from the CDC come out and say, limit mass gatherings to this, to this, to this, to this number. So really, when we set out for this plan, we wanted to put a tiered plan together that would allow us that if the Department of Health comes to us and says, hey, you might want to start thinking, well, can we go to a limited fan attendance? Can we go to no fan attendance? Or can we just do this to give our kids, we want to look our kids in the eye and just say, we want to give you every, op we gave you every opportunity we could instead of saying all or none. We don't want to go all or none. I'm not of that 
and I, I hope you guys aren't either. I'll, I'll support whatever we decide on that. But I just don't want to say we're all fans or, or no events. So that's really the plan that we had in place and, and the plan in front of you. So our Sioux Falls School District proposal to you guys is a tier one uh, worst case scenario uh, that we would have like in the spring, no practice and no events. Um, Tier two would be practice events, limited travel and no fans. And I'll break this down here, uh, tier by tier here as we go into it. And then a tier three would have a little different um, spin to it where it's just limited fans, uh, limited travel, and we would still have practice and events. And then obviously a tier four, which is where we all want to get back to um, and all activities operate as normal as they have in the past in the Sioux Falls School District. Tier one's pretty easy self-explanatory um, a tier two so at, at tier two we would have limited travel and what that would look like is we we propose that there's no overnight trips prior to postseason are prohibited um, if we get to a postseason around a 16 or, or something for from that or state tournament then we would do that and by canceling those hotels in the season maybe we have a potential in our in room in our budget to maybe go two to a room to really hopefully spread our kids out a little bit and and take one of those steps to try and mitigate the the spread of covid but specified event attendance obviously the event staff that's needed the students that are needed to participate in the game the coaches that are needed to participate in the game really get to the essential people that need to be there and unfortunately in this tier uh, we wouldn't have any adult uh, spectators, no staff spectators would be allowed to come in, no student spectators would be able to come. And that's kind of one of those last resort efforts, I would think, um, that we would maybe go to, to to try and help keep our activities going. The next tier um, would have limit, everything's pretty much the same, where we're having practices, events, and limited travel. I will say this with the state of Minnesota making the decision that they did yesterday. I don't know if you guys heard that, but they decided to move football and volleyball to the spring, which affected a lot of our programs, especially the, the, the sport of volleyball in the Sioux Falls School District. We had a few of those tournaments over there. So we're going to have to readjust a lot of our schedules. And that goes back to the, hey, we're going to have to think outside the box and get really creative once if people do start canceling and, and games and all that type of stuff. And, we're going to still try and reschedule and do everything that we can, even if that's playing a team twice in a duel or things of that nature. As long as we can keep it safe for our kids, we're going to give them all, all those opportunities. So we would still have that limited travel in this option. Now, this would look a little bit different uh, for fan attendance in the specified event attendance. What our recommendation would be is for adult spectators, we would give four tickets. And essentially what it is is passes to each rostered participant. So that would include the student participants, a student manager, a coach, um, things of that nature. If the marching band is playing at the football game, we would give their parents the four passes. In the Sioux Falls School District, what we would propose is we would offer it as an option. So if uh, Mrs. Ryder is a Lincoln High School volleyball parent, we give her option to buy four passes. So we wouldn't sell athletic passes in the Sioux Falls School District, except for our student athletic passes at the high school. So just offer her four passes for $20 and there's 10 volleyball games. So they're actually saving money. But what we're trying to do there is limit the ticket and the hand-to-hand -hand money exchange at the ticket gate so the parent could just show our pass in the Sioux Falls School District. So we're only exchanging money with the visiting team for passes. So if the family doesn't want four, they can turn those down. If they don't want any, they can turn them down. And then that would also help with the limited fan attendance that we would have. So essentially what we're trying to do is immediate family only. Mm -hmm. um, but if they have an elementary or middle school age student, they'd have to be one of those four passes for that. We would offer that same thing for the visiting team. Now the visiting team's a little bit different. They don't exchange that money right away. It would be a pass. We would use a wristband system in the Sioux Falls School District where they come, they have the wristband and then they can buy the $5 admission or the, the $3 admission if they're a student in, in that visiting team. So that would be our proposal there. Now we have a little bit of a uh, problem that we had to work through with the sub-varsity volleyball. 
uh, in that gym. The great thing is we, volleyball is a well-participated sport, um, and we have a lot of girls at the freshman level, and our gym isn't big enough to have four tickets, so, so we have to go to two, two, two event tickets per participant at the, at the freshman level. And then what we would do is encourage the 9A game, once the 9A game, and this goes against everything that we've talked about. The thing I love about our three volleyball programs in, in the city of Sioux Falls is once that 9A game was over, those girls stayed and supported 9B. And once those two games were over, they went to the next gym and they all supported the, the junior varsity and the sophomore teams and then the varsity and they all stick around and they're a community and they're a team and all those type of things. But once that 9A game is over, we're leaving. Once that 9 game B is over, we'll have a little break in there. And those are all things that we got to do to clear the gym out and then get the next group in. So that's one thing that we had to, to propose, the two tickets at the, at the freshman level. And that will look similar to the middle school present, uh, presentation that we have here. We, we would ask that uh, we allow the staff members and it would be the staff ID would be their pass in the game, but that is, is not a plus one pass. So what that is mean, they can't have a guest, they can't have their husband or, or son or daughter come with them and pay admission to the gate. The only thing that that staff ID does is give our staff member that one person admittance into the game. Um, so that would be the staff recommendation in the elementary and middle schools spectators at the high school level, like I talked about, they would have to be a part of those four spectator passes and they would have to sit with their parents. Um, it's unfortunate, I know those kids love coming and they love being in their groups and all that type of stuff, but we're just in, in different times if we're gonna be into this. Uh, the high school student spectators, we'd love to have all of our high school students attend. Um, so what we would encourage our high school students in the Sioux Falls School District to do is buy the high school activities pass for $20 and then they could get into any game. And then that way, again, it's eliminating the money exchange and all that type of stuff, hopefully protecting our, our, our ticket takers and all that type of stuff as we're going into events. But they would be able to come and we would take as many as we can now with obviously with a limited attendance at a volleyball game or a football game, now we're able to spread the student body out a little bit. So maybe seniors in this section will let the students kind of organize it a little bit, but not having everybody on top of each other. I still you know our, our first football games are packed with students, but maybe that looks a little bit different in, in organizing that with our principals and stuff like that. For the visiting team, expect in if, if the kids don't have the money to, because we know there's there's some of those kids, and they show up and they have a valid student ID. We'll we'll get them in and just say, hey, come see us on Monday, and we'll get you an A on your activity pass, and we'll figure out a way to keep to get those kids uh, implemented into our activities and keep them involved too. Uh, the visiting team they show a valid uh, student ID, and uh, Deanne, when I presented to this, brought up a really good well. How, how are we gonna know this? This is gonna be a lot of communication from AD to AD in our communities prior to the events that we're having. There's, but the good thing is I got a little straw poll here at the end of it on the AA schools and what they're gonna probably do. But there's just gonna be a ton of communication with our families, with our, our students and our communities because everything's gonna look different. It may be four tickets in Sioux Falls. It's, as you probably saw, Harrisburg's gonna be six tickets. So what does that kind of look like and the communication that's gonna have to happen? So it's gonna be a lot of work, but the visiting team can come, they can show their valid student ID and then they can pay admission to come into their event. We won't limit any visiting team students. At the middle school level, what our recommendation would be is home and visiting team spectators would be the two passes. And they don't have to pay anything for those because we've never had done that. And the whole thing on that is just to really help with the amount of people that we would have in that gymnasium and in a, in a small environment and thing of that nature. And the football to help spread them out and, and do all that type of stuff. So that is our recommendation at the middle school level. And then obviously at tier four, we're, we're back to normal. Um, our proposal, uh, here's that straw poll that I was talking to you about. So what it's gonna kind of look like at the AA level. So not only in the Sioux Falls School District, if we were to do the limited tickets or no fans, things of that nature, but there's gonna be restrictions and it's gonna look different at different communities that we travel and, and we play against. But that for, if you wanted that knowledge or not, but 
it's not in stone because a lot of those are bringing them to their board right now and uh, getting those approved, but that's kind of what it would maybe look like when we're traveling to different communities as well. So you can kind of see that four ticket number is good and really, how did you land on that? Well, we felt like two was not enough and we felt like six was probably too many and then you start talking about separate households and stuff like that and I mean, you could have kept going in different directions and we just finally landed on four and if there's two separate families and, and all those split households and stuff like that, we're gonna work, we'll work everything that we can possibly do to ensure that everyone is, is happy while trying to do the guidelines and protocols to, to reduce the, the crowd size and stuff like that. So our recommendation to, to the school board would be to start in tier three, which would be the, the limited attendance, the four passes that we talked about. Uh, we, we feel like that would be one, a, a step in the right direction to help us achieve our goal of staying in traditional learning. And if, if we do have a, hopefully we don't, uh, a lot of cases peak here, then we would tear it back and, and work to, to mitigate all that type of stuff. So I'll stick around for any questions. Thank you, Casey. Is this also same for, I saw, I see Dr. Purdue's slides. Um, is that same or are we getting a different report uh, for like band chorus? Uh, all I have is a little, there's a slight variation on our facility. Okay. Facility. Okay. Maybe well, then we'll finish with your questions when we move to you. Does that sound good? I didn't know if you were going to also report. Yeah, perfect. We'll just finish with the questions so we don't have to have you guys cross contaminate. Uh, thank you for all your work and information on this. I think it's a fair proposal, you know, knowing what the other surrounding communities have gone through. I think it's less confusing to have multiple passes, could get very confusing to families that I have a pass, why can't I get in? And so I think just sticking with one number is helpful. Um, could we do something, it would be nice on our website to know, to so that, I mean, hopefully we have a good communication if we do have to go down or up. Let's hope we can ever go up to, to, to four so that we could be on our website for families and uh, people who have passes that we could say we're at tier X right now for activities, that would be nice. Yeah, and we can we can do that. I don't know if you, you guys did receive the website. new website yeah. that we yeah. have. There is a little uh, button at the top where we could put, we're operating in tier three for tier three right now and put a link to the return to play plan that we have. So we can absolutely do that as well as Deanne has been really good about working with me to get the information with the South Dakota High School and that and giving that to our stakeholders and our families and all that type of stuff. So we'll work to get an email out to maybe on that part, but I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about as we get ready for our back to school stuff. So high schools will have their day is coming up here. And I know part of it was the purchasing of athletic passes or activity passes. So for, I just wanna make sure I understood you. So for high schools, it really won't change. They can still buy that activity pass for $20 for the students. And that would be good for the whole year. Yeah, correct? so the high school student activity pass, by going to a tier three, we're still gonna highly encourage those okay. students buying those passes. And we understand that some may not Yep. be able to do that financially and stuff like that. We sure. want to work with those students, okay. with our activities principal, with our principal, and we've always done a really good job of that, mm -hmm. no matter what, and, and not advertising that, but working with those students. Sure. Um, it'll look different, and I did have a meeting with all the Booster Club presidents uh, today, actually informing them what we were talking about at the board work session and stuff like that. So the adult Booster Club pass would would not be sold sure uh, so we wouldn't do that and that's unfortunate because it is a vital part of our booster clubs and our booster clubs will be it, it's a huge financial impact on them mm -hmm. and, and that that doesn't it's not good to say yeah but it's unfortunate and it's the times that we are but just providing that opportunity for our parents to get that pass. So it'd be a volleyball specific. So yep. if we were to offer you four volleyball passes, that parent has an option to do four volleyball specific passes, that $20 would get you into all the home volleyball games in the Sioux Falls School District. So that okay. includes Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, does not include Old Gorman home games, but only volleyball. 
can't go to football, can't do that. So we would have a football specific pass as well for those parents okay. that would include the President's Bowl. So we would do this, the separate ticket of the President's Bowl is unfortunately no longer, it would include all of your home games yeah. and your games against the Sioux Falls School District within the, in the, within the Sioux Falls School District. So the Washington Lincoln Roosevelt sure. does not include O'Gorman. Okay, so then the high school student um, has this separate activities card like they've always had, but they also have to present their ID or they, they don't our, have to? Our home students, no. That's okay. what we're encouraging. Hey, just do just your- Just the away yeah. students have to present their just ID. Just do your, on your ID, get the, yeah, the A for $20, and then that way you don't have to pay any money, gotcha. no okay. money exchange. But we want to work with the students at uh, the visiting schools, so Gorman, Harrisburg, Brandon, the ones that may travel from the other AA schools. And we couldn't really, you know, it's going to be a little easier to get the wristbands and mm -hmm. stuff, but I can see the kid forgetting it or things yeah. of that. So just make sure you always have your student ID and then you can pay admission for the visiting okay. team when they come. And then middle schools, I know a lot of times we would go to Edison Catapult Days and they would have the athletic passes for sale. So they will not have those for sale because they cannot use that. They would have to use the purchase pass with the family. So that's for high school events. So middle school events if i want to go watch my daughter play volleyball at edison i get two passes she's already there playing um if it's now basketball and she doesn't play basketball but wants to go watch are students allowed to go watch their peers unfortunately okay no. so if you're not participating or you don't have one of the passes then you're okay yeah. thank you yeah so school. no no middle school or elementary unless they're one of those two passes and at the middle school level it was strictly capacity sure that we were kind of looking at so how can we honor the the social distancing things of that nature and spread on the it, it, it it's pretty tough to do yeah. in those middle school facilities so yeah. we landed on two and that's unfortunate because we love some 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 of those middle school students, it's the safest place that they have is to come to our gymnasium yep. and, and be with their friends and watching those volleyball games. So that, that's really unfortunate. It's really hard to say right now. So it's yeah. not an easy time, but at some point we had to make a decision on how we could do this and benefit all that are involved and keep it as safe as we possibly can and do our part in trying to keep the, tradi the traditional sure. learning going. Okay, no, that's helpful, thank you. Well, certainly the school start date has been looming and all-consuming, um, and our support goes out to you, Casey, and your athletic directors, your coaches, our fans, our athletes, um, in keeping all safe. And there's, frankly, there's no perfect solution. Um, during these times of uncertainty, it conjures up fear and anger and political plays, and we do know COVID is here to stay, um, and that all of us has a role to play. So nice work on your guidelines and procedures, sort of a playbook, if you will, um, allowing us to move forward with an amount of trust and understanding and flexibility. And certainly um, we'll continue to evolve as new data surfaces. Um, and then with that, um, the return to play um, guidelines and procedures certainly evokes the sense and feeling of encouragement and, and um, just uh, hopeful um, sentiments and so good luck. Thank you. And for the public, um, Monday's board meeting, which this coming Monday, will also have some of this information as well presented. So if the public would like to attend or comment or whatever, we will be here on Monday to discuss that as well. I think my only other um, maybe suggestion is I did see a couple different places that you have stated that it will be offered digitally whenever possible, yeah. which I think is awesome. And I know there are a couple times last year that I tried to find the link and it was harder to find. And so I'm hoping that with the new website, we can make those more front and center and the calendar looked great. I didn't spend a ton of time, but I did like what I saw at first glance. And so I'm hoping we can somehow embed those links more um, so that we can encourage. Cause I think there are a lot of people who they really just want to watch. And so if we have grandparents that can't come, at least they can feel like they can talk to their kids about the game after the fact because they were part of it. So the more we can really get those, I know um, at Lincoln, they did a great job of putting them in the newsletters, but those only come once a, once a month. And so then you're like going back and trying to find the newsletter to find the link. So however we can try to push those, I think would be really helpful. Um, my only other thing I was thinking of is as students or fans or whatever are walking up to the doors to, of schools, maybe having some sort of like signage that says tier three, tier two, just because 
you might get the people who don't pay attention. They didn't go to the website, but if they walk up, they'll understand that there is some sort of a level. I don't know what that looks like. I imagine that you'll have specific entrances and exits. And so if there's some way that that can be communicated, just in case something changes, you know, quicker turnaround than they were expecting, at least we've got something before they enter the gym. I don't know how you operationalize that, but just a thought. Yeah. But otherwise, I, I really appreciate the time and thought. Um, like you said, they're not decisions anybody wants to make. We all love to watch our kids participate in their activities and the kids love to have their parents, be, you know, or be able to look up and or hear the crowd um, cheering. And so um, I think my only other plug would be, I know that our high schools specifically are selling masks with their um, team colors and stuff. And so I would encourage as many students and, and adults, frankly, as possible to show their school spirit and really show that unity of trying to keep our kids on the court or on the field or whatever it might be. And um, they're riding in the bus, they, they need to wear a mask. If they're, you know, walking into a, a building that they're gonna play in, I just feel like that's a, a, it can be another part of their accessories of their uniform. They get the matching hair ties or the matching sweatbands or whatever, like get a matching mask. And um, it's, the, it's the hot item of the year. So make it work and um, really support all of your, your teammates and your classmates on doing what they love and, and trying to keep them safe as much as possible. So at least they can all kind of have that spirit um, and try to keep, you know, what they're gonna be yelling hopefully and cheering. And so I think that will really um, keep them safe as well. So that's my plug for spirit wear masks. <laughs> Contact your school, I'm sure they're selling them. Yep. Boosters are <laughs> yeah. most of the schools, I yeah. think. So. Thank, thank you, you for all much. your suggestions and your work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Right, more. Thank you. I've been very curious because I've seen more of the high school activities association sports stuff, so I'm curious what you guys have to say. So thank you yes. for being here and doing this. Well, I want to thank Casey for all the work he's done on building this up over the summer. He really put a tremendous amount of work into that. And from a fine artist perspective, I was able to take his work and, and we just work that right in there so we have a unified approach for all of our activities. But just want to thank Casey for all his extra work that he did on that. He really deserves a lot of credit for that because there's a, quite a, a lot of documents that he's put together throughout the entire summer. Um, we're following the same guidelines as they are in the athletic activities uh, with the exception of our performance venues are much different. And what we've come up with is a way to, um, well, I'll go through the tiers here just to keep it straightforward. Tier two, what we will do is have a video performance only. In other words, we will do a video of the kids performing and get that pushed out to the parents that they can watch. There would not be an actual public performance. Mm -hmm. that would be like that, uh, video only. As we get to tier three and tier four, currently in the fine arts activities, uh, we have them rehearsing in as socially distant as possible with modifications done to how they're approaching things. Um, the expectation of the mask, and they're actually modifying their wind instruments so they can do that. When we get into tier three and tier four, what we will do is take the capacity of whatever facility they're in, we'll figure out how many people that we can get in there and we'll issue tickets as equitably as we can to the students based on that. And we'll do everything possible that we can to get those, get a video performance of that issue to the parents. And we're gonna keep that into tier four as well. Tier four is, of course, where we're activities as normal. However, um, we feel that with as many people as end up in some of those performances in those facilities, I don't, the best approach would be to keep our students socially distanced like they are in rehearsal and also do that with the audience as well. So that's our approach with that. So, the, so, the, so there won't be a separate tier for students and parents or something like that. So it's just going to be equitably distributed, like each student gets that. Yep. Yeah. And if there's, for example, we think in our high school auditoriums to properly social distance that they hold about 900, that would probably be about 300 tickets. Okay. And we have different ways to do performances. We can do multiple performances. And then, you, you know, you clear the place out, clean it, and then do the same. They already do that mm -hmm. in some of them. Can you talk a little bit about the um, alterations that you're making to some of the instruments? Sure. Based on the National Federation of High School Activities, um, they 
When this happened, they immediately got on and started doing a study, and it's called the aerosol study. It's the first of its kind in the country. It's really, I think, will have a lot of applications in terms of singing, in terms of playing. What they found in it is it's only a preliminary study right now. We don't know exactly if aerosols actually spread this. We don't know that for sure. It hasn't been documented. We don't know for sure. They don't know for, for sure exactly how much it spread. What they did find is the aerosols are significantly halted by using wearing masks. And they also put masks over the wind instrument bells. And that they do that by taking nylon material, the same material that's in pantyhose, mm -hmm. and they cut a little thing and put a rubber band around it and put multiple layers of that, and they can still play, and it inhibits the, the aerosols from coming out the end of the bell. Singers and speakers, for that matter, emit quite a lot of aerosol, and when you start singing or shouting, it really comes out. They did find the mass significantly reduced that. So we are st strongly expecting our singers and our instrumentalists to have those. Mm -hmm. and our teachers. Mm -hmm. I saw a performance um, th this summer, the pavilion, and they used like a clear type of, it was like a combo mask and shield that for yeah. like uh, vocal and performance, is that something that is looking There are, uh, of course, all kinds of inventions coming out, but um, they do have some with a plexiglass little thing in the front. Um, there also are some masks that are much larger so when you sing, you've got a little more area to work with. It is difficult to sing in a mask. Yeah, I, that, it's it's very very difficult. You know, breathing in, you, you can't get the air in as well. Now the instrumentalists will be wearing masks with a slit cut in it for the mouthpiece, so they'll will be breathing gotcha. in there. But they still have it, and if they can't do that, they are required to pull their mask down to play and then put it back up. Is there limiting on the number of like choral students together room? I mean, I know they're socially distancing. We are socially distancing in, in, uh, minimum of three feet. And okay. so we're going to separate rooms or we're shrinking down the groups. The high schools were able to use the auditorium and split the groups in half or even more than that if we need to. The auditorium's large enough we can get quite a few in there. Lots of logistics and then middle school and elementary uh how are they they are in every in the, at the elementary school for the um the music classes will be the same except they'll be seated in straight rows and they're doing less singing and they're expected to wear masks and they're doing a lot of instrumental work and some movement in those with less singing uh, the teachers really struggle teaching singing with the mask on mm -hmm. but that's just what it is right now and at the middle school level each building uh, has its own circumstance. They're working to reduce those class sizes. They can use the cafeteria um, and they can get into other, uh, if it even comes down to changing the schedule slightly so students are coming every other day mm -hmm. or every third day in order to make that work. Every, every building's got its own circumstance due to facilities though. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Well, I think we all know that um, not just athletics, but the um, arts are such an important part of our kids' education. And so I think to whatever we can do to make them still able to participate, um, even in a different way, modifications, yep. um, if we can all keep in mind that we can hunker down and make it hopefully short term, uh, that maybe we can get try to get back closer to the, the norm um, as long as we all kind of stick it out and do our best to keep us in school and keep us participating, that those are such important parts of our school day and that a lot of students, that's what they look forward to, whether it's practice after school or their chorus yep. period or whatever it is. And so it's so important to have um, the opportunity to still participate in those. So I'm sure research will continue and new, you know, new things will come about and new things will be in If they're effective, great. Let's take them and run and really enhance our programs and hopefully we can get through this. Definitely. Quickly. You know, I think Dr. Noel maybe did a study on every extracurricular um, activity a student participates in, the higher chance they have graduating and being successful in their student life. And it's so important that we figure out this port, part of this in our return to learn and, and, and allow this to happen, but yet do it in a safe manner for our, our staff and our students. So not just the academic piece of it. Exactly, so thank you.
to you, Boyd, and yeah. Casey, for all your work on doing this work. All right. District. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. President Mickelson, yes. I just add a couple things. They've done tremendous work. They make it look very simple, and the logistics, as you mentioned, are, are pretty um, complex. But we do want to just emphasize the focus has been on making sure students get to participate. And we know it's disappointing and frustrating if you don't get to go and see something that maybe you've typically participated in. But the the most important thing was the students having the ability to do their events and their activities. Um, and hopefully at some point we can return to more full scale, but that's the priority right now is our students. Thank you. There's certainly uh, inherent risk in all of this. And uh, when you do that risk benefit analysis, the benefits are there. And thank you for minimizing the risk to the extent possible so that our students can, can perform and uh, and the songs can go That's on. our goal, that we can keep moving with that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to school board committee reports. Uh, uh, board member. Me go first? Yeah, I'll just sure. start down there. <laughs> okay, one second. Um, I have one committee to report on, and that's the Education Foundation. Uh, thanks to Dr. Staben for joining our meeting yesterday. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, a couple new um, uh, new items for the foundation, and the first one is Alice's Kids, and what that uh, being involved in that national program really allows um, for more student success and flexibility that otherwise isn't um, covered in some of our other um, funds that we raise dollars for. Also, giving in COVID, uh, the the charitable giving, um, by and large, by many organizations, is on hold. Uh, and also employees are impacted because they just are not attending a, events. Um, luckily, all of our businesses that were sponsors for the state of the school district event have renewed their commitment. Um, we have moved it online this year, tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Uh, check it out. If you wanna go through Facebook, um, check out SFPSEF. Um, and that is our response of pulling it online to the current um, state of, of affairs. November, we'll have the Public School Proud event. Um, at this time, they're hoping to move it to an in-person event at the same time observing some of the safety precautions that we've all been talking about. And they will be reviewing this um, after tomorrow's event that's online to see how those figures come out and ultimately how we're impacted from a fundraising standpoint so we have a better idea of that return on um, investment our financials at this time uh, the organization has about two hundred and five thousand dollars in their checking uh, they currently made up um, eighteen thousand of the nineteen thousand that was lost in endowment investments uh, so it continues to grow and evolve and um, and they keep moving in a positive direction towards their um, overall fundraising goal. Is that it? Okay. okay. Um, so insurance, we did not uh, meet in July. Um, calendar, we haven't met. And then policy, we'll be meeting next week um, to review some policies. And then I just wanted to remind people, this seems like forever ago, um, but as far as our policy update, this school year, we will have the updated grading scale changes. Uh, that were approved in April, May, I can't remember which month it was, but um, so we previously had a seven point scale and now we'll be moving to more of that standardized 10 point scale that um, upon research we decided really made sense for the district. And so um, that's a, kind of a big change that maybe has gotten lost in the, all the other conversations that we've had. So just wanted to remind um, families and students of that. That's my only update. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I um, budget we did not meet. Um, ASBSD um, tomorrow, or the conference starts um, virtual. And then um, the uh, Sioux Empire Leadership Council, We there was a large um, round table discussion on diversity last week that was very well attended at the Downtown Holiday Inn. That is the topic the Sioux Empire Leadership Council is kind of focusing on at this point. Uh, Chamber, I got to introduce Dr. Stavum. Uh, to the chamber meeting and 
the big presentation was basically the um, informational on what they're going to do on the um, recreational marijuana uh, proposal that is up for vote this year. And um, the chamber is uh, not gonna take a position on the medical, but they are coming out opposed to the recreational uh, marijuana. So that was informational on that. And that's it. Um, housing got canceled, but the um, meeting before, we're meeting every other week. Um, we're narrowing down the candidates to be on the board and have reached out to four people. So we'll see what they have to say. Um, ASBSD tomorrow and then Friday, we go through policy and resolutions, which I'll bring back to you what the board uh, brings up. And I think that's all I got. Thank you, Todd. Any other information for the good of board? Seeing none, then we are adjourned. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn, I should say? So moved. A second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. We're adjourned. A couple more minutes.